and I must say that uh, uh, it's not that I, do, I, I prefer to be uh, defined as a cell biologist instead of geneticist. I don't know what I am because in the past I was assistant professor of histology, but I'm not really an histologist. Sometimes they say me I am molecular biologist. I'm I don't know. I'm just you know cross <laughs> collateral I, everything that you can think. Um, so as uh, Carlo said, uh, this is my favorite subject. Why? Because this is a, a, an extracellular matrix protein. I've been always uh, interested in extracellular matrix. And when you are thinking about extracellular matrix, you, maybe you are thinking about boring proteins because you think, okay, these are the structural collagen, this elastin collagen, this is not, nothing really so interesting. But in the last uh, decade, uh, matrix was, extracellular matrix was clear, uh, it's becoming very interesting because it's regulating a lot of cell processes. And there are many matrix proteins that contain domains that are able to um, regulate different cell activities and there have to be different receptors, not only for cell adhesion, but many other pro uh, processes. And collagen 6, although it's called collagen, is pretty peculiar and it's very fascinating molecule. You will say it's fascinating because you like it. Well, I have been working with this molecule now for more than 25 years. I've been doing many other things. I was in Germany, as Carlo mentioned before, doing uh, studies on gene therapy and neural development. I, I have been switching to different fields, but I always come back to my first love, and this is my love forever, that is collagen 6. And collagen 6 is, you know, collagen 1, 2, 3, 4, different collagens, uh, is, is, is pretty different from other collagen, because the collagen domain is very short. So the, the part of the protein that forms the triple vertical domain that is the typical structure that collagen have, uh, where three chains assembled together by the repetition of gly, xy, amino acid, glycine, proline, hydroxyproline. It's a very sh short part of the protein. And most of the protein is made by other domains. So it's multimodular structure, and it's very complex. At difference from other collagens, the collagen domain is very short. And uh, uh, it's made of three different, at least three different chains coded by distinct genes, different genes. And these three different chains uh, contain, yes, the collagenous domains in, in the center, but flanking the N and C terminus, there are different domains. And um, many of them are the so-called von Willebrand factor type A domain. This is a module that has been found in many secreted proteins. And collagen cells contain a lot of these uh, domains. Some of them are also alternatively spliced. So you have also isoform containing or missing some of these domains. And you see the three chains, two of them are similar in size. They are large about, uh, uh, the length is about 1,000 amino acids. But the other chain is three times larger. It's more than 3,000 amino acids. And uh, the carboxy terminus contain also other domains. And to form collagen 6, you need all three chains. And as you can see here, um, also, the biosynthesis of collagen, is, is, uh, collagen 6 is very peculiar. It's completely different from other um, matrix proteins. Because, as, like other collagens, once the cells usually are fibroblast, but also smooth muscle cell, chondrocytes, other cell types produce collagen 6. When cells uh, they need to produce collagen 6, you have the transcription of the three different genes, and then the translation into the three distinct chains, and the chains enter the endoplasmic reticulum. And once they enter the endoplasmic reticulum, they assemble together, forming the so-called monomer. Well, in the monomer, you have in one to one to one ratio, alpha one, alpha two, alpha three. And they are uh, linked together by disulfide bonds. And uh, the size is about um, half million Dalton. And uh, uh, during the secretory um, pathway, there is a, a further assembly. This is really very distinct and different from other matrix protein. Well, Monomers are assembled into dimers, 1 million Dalton, and then tetramers, 2 million Daltons. And this process is very um, complicated. It takes time. Fibroblasts take about three hours to complete all the uh, assembly and secrete collagen 6. It's, a, it's very demanding for a cell doing this. And this structure is also very large. Are among the largest structures you can find in the secretory pathway. And once the tetramers are assembled, they are secreted in the matrix where they form the beating blocks of the so-called beta microfilaments, where they associate laterally by non-covalent bonds, forming this uh, web, uh, this uh, uh, web of beta microfilaments that you can detect by different methods. Yeah, you, instance, you, you see uh, cultural fibroblasts, and you see this is really like a web. <coughs> it's a network 
of collagen-6 microfilaments. And uh, to my biggest surprise, uh, some years ago, in collaboration with a group in Cologne, in Germany, we found that uh, for many years we thought collagen-6 was uh, made only uh, by three chains, and then we found by um, probing databases that there are other three genes with high similarity to the alpha-3, and then we characterize this chain, we call them alpha-4, 5, and 6. So actually, no, now there are six different genes coded for collagen-6 chains, and these chains have a very strict exploration distribution, can substitute for alpha-3. So you can imagine how complicated is this molecule, because you need three different chains. One of the chains can be one of these four uh, different chains. You have alternative splicing. Also in this chain, there is alternative splicing. So you, you can modulate very, um, very uh, precisely these isoforms in different tissues. And uh, as I said, collagen-6 is, uh, is a matrix protein, but the difference from other matrix proteins is very close to the cell surface, uh, where it forms uh, a kind of a bridging, um, it has a bridging role, because it binds different cell receptors. There is no specific receptor for collagen-6. It's able to bind different integrins that are a typical receptor for matrix proteins, but also uh, membrane proteoglycans. This is a, a interesting proteoglycan because it's binding collagen-6 and also growth factors, and most likely also other receptors uh, that now we are uh, characterizing. So it's, uh, it's able to bind different cell receptors. In the matrix, it's binding different matrix proteins. Here are only some of them, different collagens, fibronectin with high affinity, is able to bind fibronectin with high affinity, by glycan, decorin, perlecan, and also other matrix proteins. And uh, collagen-6 is considered kind of, of ubiquitous matrix protein because you can find it in many, many different tissues. But it's not uh, ubiquitous in the sense that it's uh, found everywhere at the same uh, uh, level, the same amount. It's a very strict regulation of collagen-6 expression during embryogenesis. This is a, a mouse embryo at mid-gestation where you see this is a in situ hybridization. And the expression is very strong in all mesenchymal derived tissue. This is a northern blot in post uh, after birth, uh, mm, newborn mice, uh, young mice, and adult and old mice. You see, du during uh, um, postnatal life, the expression decreases, but the protein is stable. So the protein does not decrease in the matrix, it's accumulating in the matrix. And you can see that there is a, it's expressed in many different organs, in particular, it's very abundant in skeletal muscle, which is interesting now for what I will tell you uh, uh, in a few minutes. And as I said, this uh, expression different organs is tightly regulated. And uh, the, um, um, the upstream regions of the three different genes is very, is very complicated in the sense that you have a basal promoter, but you also have different answers and silencer, uh, um, tightly regulated expression of collagen-6 in different tissues. There are an answer for peripheral nerves, one an answer for cartilage, one an answer for skin, one an answer, an answer for skeletal muscle. In skeletal muscle, collagen-6 is found around the muscle fibers. So this is a, a cross-section uh, of uh, muscle. Um, the, you see these are muscle fibers, but the green is uh, uh, labeling for collagen-6. As it found, it's called endomysium, so around the basal lamina of muscle fibers, all around. But it's not produced by uh, muscle fibers. Collagen-6 is produced by fibroblasts in muscle. And you, you can clearly um, understand this. If you do primary cultures for muscle, they contain fibroblasts and myoblasts, where fibroblasts, they produce and secrete collagen-6, and the proteins deposit the surface of myoblasts. So it's very interesting, because in muscle, the protein, you will see, is very important for muscle fibers. It's essential for keeping the structure and function of muscle, but it's produced by fibroblasts. And fibroblasts, they produce the protein in response to signals that are released from myogenic cells. And indeed, that I mentioned you before that there is a specific enhancer, for instance, called 6A1 gene for the alpha-1 chain, which is about 7KB upstream the transcription start side, that confers specific expression in, to muscle, but muscle fibroblasts, not um, myogenic cells. And this is a, a um, transgenic mouse, is a, is a, these are section protogenic mice with this enhancer, uh, fused to LACZ, where you see that the green nuclei, this is the nuclear LACZ, are found outside of myogenic cell and muscle, fi muscle fibers, but are, uh, correspond to, uh, to fibroblasts, if you can see. 
staining with lemony is outside of lemony. And also, it's interesting, this is an aspect we didn't investigate further, but it's very interesting. Um, some years ago, we published this uh, um, study where we found that exp the activation of this enhancer for muscle fibroblasts requires the presence of myogenic cells. Because if you do the transgenic mice in, in, a, in a wild type condition, so in the standard condition, you see that the laxative staining is found in many muscles. But if the um, transgenic mouse is crossed with a um, mutant that is not able to uh, differentiate into muscle, the so-called MET-D mouse, that is not able to um, uh, give rise to muscles, fibroblasts are not able to express collagen 6. And uh, we also uh, performed in vitro study where we, were, um, we had data confirming that there is a a secreted signal. We don't know yet clearly which signal it is, but you can understand from this that it's a kind of uh, uh, non cell autonomous role that collagen 6 has in, in muscle because fibroblasts produce the protein, but the protein is produced in response to signal released by biogenic cells. Once they produce the protein, it's important for the myogenic cells. Well, this is a cartoon showing you that the, uh, for at the surface of muscle fibers, you have the so sarcolemma plasma membrane with different receptors. You have basal lamina, and here's the collagen 6, very close to the surface, interacting with different receptors and activating different signaling pathways. And uh, many years ago, this was in 1996, uh, where I was uh, coming back from the Max Planck Institute, where I was there for having in my hands the tools for producing knockout mice, uh, we uh, decided to uh, produce knockout mice for collagen 6. So the question was, what is the role of collagen 6 in the body? Um, and this was the first knockout we made at that time. We were also proud to be the first group in Italy producing knockout. For a long time, we were the only one doing knockout in Italy. And still now, we are among the few groups producing knockouts, together with Andres, for instance, and others in Italy. We have uh, these tools in our hands. And we have a lot of requests to produce knockout mice from other teams in Palo and um, also from other, from other uh, places in Italy. But this knockout mouse that now has 20 years is an example that once you have a knockout mice, mouse, and if you are lucky, then you will understand what I mean with you are lucky, uh, you can have a model where you can work for many years. So it's important also to think about PhD student as a postdoc, as an important tool, a precious tool in your hand, and you must be really uh, motivated to understand the mechanism, and you will find targets, and you have human disorders, and you can also reach the, uh, the point where you can propose novel therapies based on what you see in mice. Okay, we inactivated, uh, we produce knockout mice by inactivated echo 6 a one gene. I told you before, you need a three chains to assemble and secrete collagen 6. So the idea here was if we inactivate one of the three genes and we uh, ablate the production of that chain, you are not able to assemble and secrete the collagen 6. And we put a neocassette just uh, uh, downstream of the uh, translational uh, star codon. So we have a null mutation here. And uh, we put this in the cells, so we put the cells in vivo, we bred mice, and when we got the mice, we were very surprised. Why? Because collagen 6 is, uh, has a wide, uh, widespread distribution in the body. It's also expressed during embryogenesis. So the idea was uh, inactivation, the ablation of collagen 6 uh, might be lethal. Mice die during embryogenesis. Or if they are born, they should show a very se severe defects, very, very strong defects. But these mice uh, uh, look normal. So here you have this is a, a genotyping uh, where you have. Uh, wild type heterozygous and uh, uh, knockout homozygous. And uh, we genotyped you know, hundreds of uh, liters and they are present in Mendelian ratio. They are apparently normal, they are fertile, they apparently have a normal lifespan. So we were very uh, upset and depressed at that time. We said, well, what is this now? The first question for us was, are we sure that we inactivate completely the uh, secretion? We ablate completely the secretion of collagen 6 by inactivating this chain. So we perform RNA analysis to understand whether there was a um, low level of expression of the normal RNA, but this is uh, overexposed. Well, you see, these are all homozygous knockout mice. There is no, collagen, no, no mRNA for 6 a one completely absent. But more important is just an example. We check for the protein in vivo and in vitro. 
Knockout mice, they don't uh, assemble and secrete any collagen 6 at all. These are cartula fibrous. Here there is a lot of collagen 6 deposed around the cells. And here you see there is a very tiny dots. These are endoplasmic reticulum, but the other two chains, alpha 2 and alpha 3, try to assemble, not, not able to assemble, and then they are degraded, and there is no secretion of collagen 6. So it's a real knockout. There is no collagen 6 there. But this is me when I was uh, almost 20 years ago, uh, 20 years ago, handling these mice and checking, you know, genotyping them. I realized that since the beginning that although the mice look normal, you must think that animal house is a very artificial condition. You are feeding the mice, they are there, you know, they don't have to, uh, to look for food or escape from uh, predators. Uh, handling them, I realized that they, they show so, uh, signs of hypotonia. So knockout mice, if you, if, you, if you keep a, a mouse hanging by the tail, it tries to beat you, but they are not really unable to move. They try to do something, but they are much weaker than uh, the wild type. They also showed a, a decreased grasp. If you put them over the cage, they were not able to grasp to, to, to do the cage leads. Uh, so we thought maybe there is a weakness. A cis collagen 6 is expressing muscle, which we, we decided to check more precisely the, this weakness. So uh, we measure muscle strength, and we realize that there is a very strong decrease of muscle strength in knockout mice. We perform an histology of muscle, and uh, we found that there is a um, myopathy phenotype. In knockout, there, is, there are many degenerating fibers and also regenerating. You know, mass is able to regenerate. So regenerating fibers, they have a central located nuclei instead of having a nuclei at the surface, uh, the periphery. You see, in the wild, there are no central located nuclei. And uh, by using different tools, even for instance, um, systemic injection with this dye, Evans Blue, which is a very strong blue uh, staining, is circulated with the, with the body fluids. It doesn't cross uh, the intact cells, like um, intact myofibers, the wild type are completely negative. And in knockout, we have these many fibers are positive to this dye and also have a regular shape. So we decided to check better what was going on there. Mice, uh, knockout mice for collagen 6, they have uh, a phenotyping muscle. They have myopathy, histological alteration, functional alteration. And then we said, okay, let's check for electromicro electro by electromicroscopy for a mass ultra structure. Collagen 6 is in the matrix. So we would expect to have alteration outside of muscle fibers, <coughs> in the matrix around muscle fibers. I mean, what you have seen before, is, uh, like here, oh, sorry, too fast. Uh, maybe you have alteration in this part where it's collagen 6. By electromicroscopy, you, sh you should see that endomysium is altered. But indeed, what we found by electron microscopy is that the extracellular matrix is uh, less dense, is a bit altered, but not so much. What was really striking were these alterations that we found inside massive fibers. Really impressive, because we found that there are alterations in two important organs. Mitochondria, with a completely abnormal shape, with uh, uh, tubular cristae and a swollen appearance, and endoplasmic reti reticulum, which in massive sarcoplasmic reticulum is important for the excitation contraction coupling because it is, is the deposit for calcium. And this is the same modification. So there's a called triads, where you have the sarcoplasmic reticulum and the T tubules. And here, if you check the triads, T tubule is normal, sarcoplasmic reticulum is very highly dilated. So we decided from this, it, it was strange because collagen 6 is missing in the, in the extracellular matrix, but we have alteration inside muscle fibers. So what was going on there? Does this reflect also? Functional alteration in these organisms. I don't show you today data about calcium eustasia, but we found the calcium eustasia are normal, reflecting this abnormal structure of sarcoplasmic reticulum. More important is what happens in mitochondria. Of course, when you are studying a phenotyping mouse where you enter into aspects that are not into your background, you need to collaborate. And uh, uh, this is an example of different collaboration we established during the years. And I was lucky because most of these uh, <coughs> collaboration <coughs> I could establish not only in Italy, but sometimes even in Padova. When I found these mitochondrial alterations, I had just to move one floor down in our building. I'm at the third uh, floor. In the second floor, there is an expert of mitochondria, Paolo Bernardi. And I Bring, uh, bring him this, uh, brought him this picture and told him, can we measure, um, can, we, can, can we understand if mitochondria are working normally? 
and you say, it's not easy, but we can do it. And here you see what he has been doing. Uh, things that for me are completely mm, something that I didn't know. I almost hated mitochondria at that time because mitochondria were too complicated for me. In the sense that when I was a student, I never had a professor explain me uh, carefully and clearly what are mitochondria. Paolo Bernardi uh, fascinated me my, with mitochondria. And what do you see here? Every of, uh, every of these trays is a single muscle fiber. So we isolated <coughs> muscle fibers from wild type knockout mice. We kept them in culture as inter muscle fibers. We loaded them with this uh, um, fluorescent dye that is a lipophilic cationic dye that accumulated inside mitochondria when mitochondria maintain the uh, mitochondria membrane potential, so the electrochemical gradient. And in wild type fibers, you see that even after this uh, arrowhead means the application of some stress, like oligomycin. Oligomycin is inhibiting ATP synthase. So what is in mitochondria producing ATP? They are able to maintain the mitochondria membrane potential. But knockout mice, there is a very a rapid and very marked depolarization after addition of oligomycin. So there is a latent mitochondria dysfunction. Mitochondria are not working normally in knockout mice. There is also a very high incidence of apoptosis in knockout fibers. And this mitochondrial dysfunction, uh, Paolo then told me, we can, uh, uh, I told him why there is this, what is uh, happening in uh, knockout mice. So the first thing that we were doing here, you see a different way to show the same data like before, instead of having single traces, these are all traces together with a uh, standard error, wild type and knockout. Is reversible because if you these are knockout fibers, if you put them over laminin, that is an important protein for muscle fiber, but they, 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 they don't change their behavior after addition, after plating over laminin. But if you plate them over collagen 6, the missing protein, they behave like wild type. So it's reversible, it's directly depending on the lack of collagen 6. But there was something more we could do. <coughs> Paolo told me we can use cyclosporin A. Why cyclosporin A? Asking me. Cyclosporin is a, an immunosuppressant, but cyclosporin is, is binding the so-called cyclophilins in different cells, including lymphocytes, where it has this important immunosuppressive role that is particularly important for transplanted patients. But cyclosporin A is also binding a cyclophilin that is inside mitochondria that is um, um, modulating the opening of the so-called mitochondria permeability transition pore, PTP which is a big channel that flickers normally, opens and closes, but when it remains open, mitochondria depolarize. So Paolo told me, if you use cyclosporin A, we can understand if there is excessive opening of this PTP in mitochondria. And uh, indeed, this was the case, because you can see knockout fibers, and knockout fibers, the green, uh, where we added in medium cyclosporin A. So there is this mitochondrial dysfunction is reversible, is independent, on the increased opening of this PTP channel in mitochondria. And the same effect we can obtain by um, on apoptosis. If we plate uh, fibers over collagen 6, they completely uh, restore the survival. If you use cyclosporin A, again, so apoptosis, the increased apoptosis also depending on the mitochondrial dysfunction, which is not surprising because you know there is the so-called intrinsic pathway depending on mitochondria and so on. So then we decided to move in vivo, and uh, we wanted to understand how important is mitochondrial dysfunction for uh, the phenotype. And uh, another question was, is, is treatment of mice with cyclosporin A able to re uh, recover the phenotype, since cyclosporin A is a drug that you use in patients too? Um, it was not a simple experiment to be done because we spent months and months in order to find the right regimen of treatment, the dosage, the timing, and after six months of work to find the, the, the most appropriate treatment, we went on, the, uh, on with the treatment of wild type of knockout mice with uh, vehicle and cyclosporine. So vehicle, the solution without the active compound, mice, they have the same alteration like untreated mice, but treating mice for only four days with cyclosporine A, was able to restore completely the uh, ultrastructure. So mitochondria, they, now they become normal. Sacroplasmic reticulum become normal again. Administration of cyclosporin A <coughs> is sufficient to recover the ultrastructural defects in collagen sync knockout mice, but also the mitochondrial dysfunction in vivo, apoptosis, and also strength. You will see later on data about 
functional uh, recovery. And this was an experiment that allowed us to publish in uh, 2003 the uh, first milestone paper of this that was um, the one that maybe you saw before on in nature, in nature uh, genetics where we say uh, knockout of collagen 6 uh, cause mitochondrial dysfunction and alteration of sacroplasmic reticulum, which is reversible and can be recovered by addition of sacrosporine. The reviewer are very excited about these experiments. Uh, can, I, can I ask yeah. a naive question? Uh, how did you know that collagen, uh, alteration of collagen, alters mitochondria function and not vice versa? Why? Because uh, is collagen 6 that is uh, mutated. Okay. So what I was not expecting is that if you miss a matrix protein, you have alteration in mitochondria. Yeah. Now the question is, the only difference between wild type and knockout, they don't have a collagen 6, a genetic point of view. But the question now that uh, uh, relates to what you say, what is in between? Why collagen 6, the lack of a matrix protein, is altering mitochondria? We will reach this uh, part of this answer later in the presentation. Uh, why was important? Because in the meanwhile, if you are lucky, I said, you have a model of human disorder. You know what happened in 1996, when we started to have the data on the collagen six knockout mice, we went around at meetings and uh, showing this data, and there were some geneticists, human geneticists, working on uh, uh, inherited muscle diseases, dystrophies and myopathies, that uh, decided uh, to uh, check for mutation of collagen six genes in orphan uh, disorder of muscle. And the first one was this Bethlehem myopathy, where Bethlehem stands for Yab Bethlehem, the clinician in, in the 70s first described this uh, uh, muscle disorder. And the Dutch group in me, Megan, showed that it is due to mutation of collagen 6 genes. And some years later, an Italian group in Rome, um, Enrico Bertini, for the first time showed that, that another human disorder, much more severe, that has this complicated name, is very severe, even more severe than Duchenne muscle dystrophy, is caused by mutation of collagen 6. And later on, we, in collaboration with the group in Bologna, the hospital Rizzoli, we, we also demonstrated another human disorder is caused by mutation of collagen 6. So you have a different human disorder caused by mutation of the gene for the same protein. It's maybe the most important example for us where uh, the uh, alteration of a single protein is causing different disorder. You may know that dystrophy, for, uh, for instance, can cause Duchenne or Becker. Others can cause different forms. In this case, collagen 6, now we know, cause at least four or five different muscle diseases. Bethlehem myopathy is a quite benign um, disorder because it is already present at birth. It is an early onset, but it, it is present with the mild muscle, muscle weakness at birth, with congenital contractures. The congenital contracture is a typical sign of these disorders. You can see here the contraction in the fingers. It's very slowly progressive, so it's usually is benign, and patients very rarely they have a respiratory problem, they need a wheelchair even at the age of 40 or 50, although they have muscle weakness. Ulrich congenital muscle dystrophy is much more severe because it also has an early onset, but it's present at birth with generalized muscle weakness with the lay motor milestones, and many patients, they are never achieved the ability to work independently. Um, with a lot of contractures, um, very rapid progression, and uh, with the early respiratory failure during the first, second decade of life, causing, although it requires uh, artificial ventilation support and uh, tracheotomy um, several times, uh, often cause the uh, death during the between the first and second, maximum third decade of life. You might wonder now, why mutation of the same genes cause disorders so different in the aspect of the clinical symptoms? Bethlehem myopathy is pretty mild, Ulrich is severe, and are mutation in the same genes. The genotype phenotype correlation is complicated because uh, uh, you can have a mutation causing one or the other disease uh, in any of the three genes, and sometimes even in, in the same part of the protein. So changing amino acids that are very close, in one, ca in one case causing Bethlehem, the other case causing Uri. To simplify what happens is the effect that the mutation have on collagen 6. So you have your control, uh, this is muscle fibroblast electron microscopy, so this is a healthy donor, 
a nice study for collagen-6. This is what would usually happens in beta myopathy. There is a decrease of collagen-6, but not complete absence. And this is URI congenital muscular dystrophy, that where you don't have any collagen-6 at all. Of course, having this disorder then uh, led us to uh, perform several studies in patients to understand whether there were the same defects that we found in mice. And you see, in different papers, we checked and indeed found that there are dilatious acroplasmi reticulum, these are patients, uh, alteration mitochondria with the tubular crystals, swollen appearance, um, a very strong increase of apoptosis which is very, very, very high. In some cases reach more than 100, 300, up to 500 times the incident that you, you have in, in a healthy donor. Mitochondrial dysfunction isolated fibers, uh, fibers from a uh, healthy donor. They maintain the memory potential, mitochondrial memory potential. In a patient, depolarization. And it's reversible because it can be reversed by cyclosporine A or platin over collagen 6. And the same is true for apoptosis in vitro, in muscle fibers, you can restore by plating over collagen 6, it's additional cyclosporine. In practical terms, if you compare mouse and human, you have a very strong uh, similarity uh, concerning the defects. Mitochondrial dysfunction, reversible, depending on cyclosporine, on the opening of the PTP and recorded by cyclosporine A, and apoptosis. This then led also to a clinical trial in patients with cyclosporine A that I, I will not tell you anything today about this, that uh, uh, we performed uh, with a physician in uh, uh, Bologna, Luciano Merlini, that is a worldwide expert of these disorders. As I told you, sometimes you are lucky, you can collaborate with Italian teams instead of going abroad. And uh, he performed three months uh, um, pilot clinical trial in patients with cyclosporine A, pills, like uh, those that are taken by transplanted patients, and then extended the study for one year, and uh, this demonstrated that in, in indeed you are able to um, recover mitochondrial dysfunction and apoptosis in patients by uh, taking this piece, uh, cyclosporine A. The problem is that you cannot use this as a therapy, because cyclosporine A is an immunosuppressant, and you cannot really think about this as a long term. But it was useful because it showed us that, like in mice, if you uh, use this in patients, you are able to, re to recover the uh, defects. So now it comes the most important part for me, because this is an older part of the story. And uh, it's also an answer to what Carlo asked before, in the sense that you have a collagen 6 miss present usually in the matrix, and somehow you don't know what is in between is impinging inside mass of fiber on organelles and on cell survival. If you don't have a collagen 6, then you have all these alterations. So what is in between here? The most obvious question you may, ri you may raise is check for the receptor that is transducing this effect. But as I told you, there are so many different receptors, uh, and none of them is specific for collagen 6 among those that we uh, know now. Uh, that is complicated to uh, tackle this question from up, uh, from collagen 6 down to the, uh, to, to the cell. We decided to, uh, to uh, use an approach that is bottom-up, starting from what could be there, why there is accumulation of altered organs. And it was a brilliant work that, uh, at that time, a PhD student, now is a postdoc, now is abroad, is in Frankfurt, in Germany, Paolo Grumati, it was uh, uh, performing a lot of studies, say, now I'm checking for different signaling pathways, kinase and so on, in, an, in order to understand what could be uh, a pathway that could be altered. But when he was doing this study, uh, he checked for this kinase, that is IMP kinase. This is a kinase that is a sensor of uh, the ATP and P ratio. So when you, you have decrease of ATP, you have increased the activity of IMP kinase. And you see that in the knockout, there is more active form of IMP kinase. Which is not strange, because if you are ultra mitochondria, you may think that there is an energetic deficit causing this. But what is interesting here, when he saw this, he thought, MP kinase, together with AKT, are two important kinase acting on autophagy. So he decided to check for this process, which is autophagy. Autophagy, the name says autophagy looks like the cell is eating part of itself. It was considered a kind of cell suicide in the past, but now it's known that autophagy is a very important homeostatic process for the cell. 
uh, during development in adulthood, during condition when you need uh, to, uh, when you have starvation, is able to uh, recover uh, energy and nutrients for the cell. And that's been shown to be important in many different things. Autophagy everywhere is one of the processes that now is becoming important in different physiological and pathological aspects. Autophagy in health and disease, we see that in pathological conditions, because to cause in many de neurodegenerative diseases, in other diseases, liver disease, in cancer, in inflammation, and so on. And we decided to investigate for autophagy because we were thinking, okay, you have accumulation of altered organs. So maybe autophagy is increased because there are altered organs. And autophagy needs also to remove damaged part of the cell, uh, parts that are somehow not functional anymore. And this is a simplified cartoon of how autophagy works. You have uh, initially the formation of the so-called isolation membrane by some protein that uh, um, are binding to this uh, membrane that is forming. And it is, uh, then this is a, a engulfing a part that should be removed, like an altered mitochondrial, forming a double vesicle, uh, double membrane vesicle that is called autophagosome, because the vesicle is a double membrane, and then fusion with lysosome from the autophagal lysosome, where there is degradation, the material, and the recycling the cells. This is useful because since several years now, uh, many of the proteins involved in a, uh, induction and regulation of autophagy has been uh, um, uh, discovered, also by genetic studies in yeast, where this was very important, all these ATG, 1, 2, and so on, were uh, found by mostly by uh, Japanese groups using yeast, but also by biochemical studies in uh, mammals, similar to the story of the uh, cell cycle, you know, at, like at that time, several decades ago, they were able, by merging studies, genetic study, yeast, biochemical study, in, uh, in vertebrates uh, to understand the process. So this is also important because among these proteins, one is a, a, is a marker that can be nicely used as a marker for investigative autophagy. This LC3 is a protein that uh, in, in, in active form is a cytosolic, but once autophagy is, um, st is started, is induced, it, it becomes lipidated, it is attached to a, a, a lipid, and it changes a little bit its properties and also the migration in gel. And you see, in, you see here Western blot for LC3 in antibody, where you have this upper band is the inactive form, the lower band is the lipidated form. So in the, in the wild type mouse, you see that the ratio between the two bands is uh, similar, but in the knockout, the active form is much less. So this suggested to Paolo <coughs> Grumati that there is an impaired lipidation of C3, so it looks like there is a defective autophagy. We decided to investigate this uh, more carefully by putting mice under starvation. Food starvation is a stimulus for inducing autophagy. 24 hour starvation in mice is able to induce autophagy in different organs. And uh, after starvation, there is a strong induction of autophagy, lipidation of C3 wild type, but it's not the same in a knockout. Knockout mice, they don't have the same induction like the wild type. It's very, uh, low, it's very low levels. There is no formation of autophagosome. This is a, a morphometric analysis by electron microscopy of autophagic vesicle in a wild type knockout. So defective regulation of autophagy. And uh, it was not clear at that time where it could be due to impaired formation of autophagosome or to excessive autophagic flux where autophagosome are rapidly um, delivered to lysosome. So this, this difference that you see here, this lower lipidation LC3 could depend either on impaired autophagy or excessive autophagy. You need to investigate the autophagic flux to understand this. Studying autophagic flux is quite complicated because you have to use drugs and different tools. For instance, by using chloroquine, which is inhibiting the fusion of uh, autophagosome with lysosome, so you block the fusion, you can understand whether there is accumulation of autophagosomes. In the wild type, there is accumulation, but in the knockout, there is no accumulation. And also, we use uh, this uh, uh, by starving at different times, where we saw that indeed, uh, again, in the knockout, there is impaired formation of autophagosome. So, indeed, there is a impaired autophagy, defective formation of autophagosome. Before you saw a simplified cartoon of how autophagy works, just focus on this part of the cartoon here, because there are different mechanisms for autophagy. What we are studying here is the so-called macro-autophagy. 
Well, here you have more, more uh, precisely different proteins involved in the formation of the uh, isolation membrane. And also those proteins in, that in uh, mitochondria are needed to remove mitochondria with a process that is called mitophagy. Let me show you this because we decided to focus on some of these proteins to understand what is uh, wrong with autophagy flux. And in particular, we focused on backlink one, which is very important because it's forming a complex needed for the formation of autophagosomes. And with NIP3, that is important for mitophagy. And we found that uh, both backlink one and NIP3 in knockout mice are defective, are much less after starvation, they increase a lot in the, in the wild type, as you expect, because they activate autophagy, but not in a knockout. The next question was, can autophagy be reactivated? Is this a complete block? Or are we able to overcome this defect? We decided to put mice under 30 hours starvation, which is pretty extreme for a mouse. It's a, you know, a mouse has a lifespan of one year and a half, two years, so it's like a big weeks for, uh, for, uh, for a human. And, uh, what happens is that the wild type now, they show signs of suffering. They start to have also some mu muscle atrophy. Uh, and they have a lot of induction of autophagy, of course. But what we see now in the knockout, the knockout, they look better. In particular, you now you have uh, um, induction of autophagy. So if you are able to push the stimulus very strong, then you are able in a knockout to induce autophagy. You see formation of autophagosomes, and you see also by lateral microscopy formation of autophagosomes in sim at similar levels in the wild type of knockout. But the most, most important is the effect of the prolonged starvation the phenotype. After 30 hours starvation, compared to fed mice, knockout mice now they have the recovery of ultrastructural alteration in mitochondria sarcoplasmic reticulum. Mitochondria, they have a recovery of the mitochondrial depolarization. Apoptosis now is brought down to similar level of the wild. There is a rescue of the myopathy phenotype. Think about patients. It's not a, an optimal way to uh, induce autophagy in patients because you cannot put patients in starvation for weeks, of course. So fast is a R score is very acute. So we thought. Are there milder and long-lasting dietary regimens able to activate autophagy and ameliorate the phenotype? Something where we are able to activate autophagy in a more physiological way. We look at the literature thinking to find something useful for us. We were surprised there was nothing. The only thing that could help us is that is known that in vitro, and also a few studies in vivo, amino acid deprivation is a, is a stimulus for inducing autophagy. There are certain amino acids that can induce autophagy by acting on the uh, AKTM TOR pathway that is essential. When it's active, you have protein synthesis. When it's inhibited, this uh, uh, leads to induction of autophagy. And amino acid deprivation is a, an important uh, signal for inducing autophagy. So we thought we can design a low protein diet. We uh, contacted the company and told, we want a diet where we decrease the protein content in the diet. Protein contains amino acid. And we decided to have a cheap way and a simple way to reduce amino acid in the diet. These are the same calories. So the, uh, the amount of energy in the diesel protein diet is the same. But the only thing that is decreased is proteins. Instead of 22%, they are 5% now, one fourth of the normal level. We fed the mice with this uh, low protein diet, uh, chow. Uh, for one month, and at the end we check for different things, our induction of autophagy, apoptosis, muscle phenotype, strength. After one month of protein diet, uh, you have activation of autophagy, similar to when you uh, put mice under prolonged starvation. You see now, wild type and knockout, they have lipidation C3, backlink 1, similar levels, BNIP3, formation of autophagosomes. Histology in the knockout is ameliorated, Electromicroscopy ameliorated, apoptosis is decreased. Strength, I, sp I told you uh, about strength several times. You, you see also some graphs, graphs about strength. These are wild type of knockout mice maintained in the standard diet, normal diet. You see the knockout, they have a decreased strength. And this is a wild uh, knockout mice after uh, one month of protein diet. This, you see they have similar strength in this histogram. You see that uh, if you check the orange one knockout, and the green or wild type, they have a similar strength. They have a very strong induction of strength after 
increase of strength after uh, one month low protein diet. You might wonder now, but you told us before about cyclosporine A. So you may think, what is the point now? If you use cyclosporine A, you recover as a structure, histology, strength. And if you induce autophagy, you have the same effect. But you told us that cyclosporine A is acting on mitochondria directly, where here you act on autophagy. So the question is, are the two things related? And we decided to check about cyclosporine A for autophagy. Nobody ever investigated what is the effect of cyclosporine A autophagy. We found that it is, surprisingly, is a very potent inducer of autophagy. So the effect we obtain in cyclosporine A are also related to the fact that this drug induces autophagy. And uh, uh, is more potent even than, than putting them under diet. But as I told you before, unfortunately, this is a not, not a good... Uh, uh, way for therapy in patient because it's immunosuppressive. Moving to patient, moving to patient, uh, we check, we collect from different centers uh, biopsies from Ulrich and Bethlehem patients, the patient affected by the severe and milder form, and we wanted to check whether in this there is a decreased autophagy in patients, is impaired autophagy. It was pretty impressive because if you check for Becklin 1, the important protein forming the complex for the formation of autophagosome by Western blot, all the patients that we checked, there is almost complete absence of, of Becklin 1. And there is a decrease in Bethlehem myopathy, not so strong like in Ulrich. It's related somehow to the clinical sign. It's similar, it's, um, it's suggested that you have autophagy defect in patient, and it's related to the clinical symptom. In Ulrich, there is, there is a very strong uh, autophagy defect. In Bethlehem patient, is present less in a less severe uh, way. Another milestone work that brought us uh, to, to a paper in Nature Medicine, uh, now is almost five years ago, um, that we are happy because the several comments uh, in not only Nature Medicine, but all in other journals, was also commenting in Science and other journals, where what was uh, uh, appreciated in this work, that was the first demonstration of a muscular dystrophy of muscle disorder where autophagy is defective, which led different groups, including us, to check for uh, the possibility where autophagy, defective autophagy, may play a role also in other muscular dystrophies. And we found that our defective autophagy is a kind of a common pathogenic mechanism in different dystrophies. In collagen 6, it's very defective, but also in other dystrophies, you can find defective autophagy which is similar to what other uh, teams in, uh, worldwide found for new neurodegenerative disease, where defective autophagy plays a role in Alzheimer, Parkinson, Huntington, and other neurodegenerative diseases. So to end with this, I would like to uh, give you the so-called take-home message of this. So what we found that in wild-type muscle, you need a basal level of aut autophagy to keep the homeostatic uh, clearance of organelles. Muscle is a, is, is a tissue, these, these cell myofibers are, are, are subjected to a lot of stress during contraction. So they need to have autophagy working properly. In the uh, episode of collagen 6, you have impaired autophagy, the accumulation of altered organs, leading to a sexy autophagy and leading uh, at the end to uh, the dystrophic uh, phenotype. But if you are able to reactivate autophagy by different means, prolonged starvation, low protein diet, um, drugs, uh, uh, natural compounds, you can now reactivate autophagy, remove the altered organ, restore myofibrillar survival, rescue the dystrophic phenotype. Of course, there is still the question about the, what is in between there, the mechanism, and we are working a lot on this. We found now that what is in between is very important, the part having to do with the AKT. We have, I don't have to this detailed data, but now we understood that what happens in knockout mice there is excessive uh, persistent phosphorylation AKT, which is inhibiting the pathway for autophagy through mTOR, is also inhibiting the, the uh, activation of these FOXO transcription factors that are important for the tra uh, transcription of autophagy genes. So there is a kinase that is very important here, that is AKT, that is not properly regulated in knockout mice. And again, what is now here? Okay, I can tell you something about what is there. We are checking for the uh, typical receptor for collagen 6 that are integrins, 
thinking that since the integrals are acting on AKT pathways, the AKT pathway, um, there might be alteration on the signals downstream integrals. We checked all these signals, focal adhesion kinase, interlinked kinase, and they look apparently normal. We don't have data telling us that integrin signaling is altered. What we found, surprisingly, is that the alteration is in a completely different kind of receptor that was completely unexpected to have a, a, a link with collagen 6, that is the insulin IGF-1 receptor. We checked for this pathway. We found that the IRS-1, that is a downstream signal, downstream of this receptor, acting on AKT, is very altered in the uh, knockout mice. The uh, active, um, the phosphorylated form of this, of this IRS-1 is much higher than in the wild type. So it looks like there is a metabolic deregulation. And we are now checking more carefully what is going on here. Okay, I would like to finish this uh, uh, with uh, a take home message. That is, uh, I hope to have this. No, I don't have the slide, but I tell you by words. Um, okay, before I enter into the final thanks to the people. What is the message I would like to give to the students here? This is a model that has now more than 20 years. And by uh, studying the phenotype, entering to mechanism, and um, checking for targets for therapy, uh, having a model for human disorders, this became a very precious tool. And after two decades, in my lab, there are different PhD, a post of different teams, still working a lot with this model. So if you have a knockout mouse, always think that it could be a very precious uh, tool that you might have in your hands. You must be brave and skilled enough to check what is altered there, especially when you have a mouse that doesn't show any phenotype. You remember we were depressed and somehow uh, upset, having a mouse without any clear sign of alteration. Well, maybe that mouse is a very important model for you. It may have a defect in uh, uh, memory, in uh, behavior. We have a mouse model in the lab. Now we learn the, the lesson from this for other matrix protein where we found the mice are normal. Then we check the mice. This protein is expressed in the cardiovascular system. The mice have hypertension. So it's a model for hypertension. And they are apparently normal. So this is something important you should always keep in mind. Don't never, never think that a mouse that doesn't show a phenotype is not useful. Maybe it's the most useful mouse that, that you might have in your hands. OK, before, uh, to finish with this, I would like to thank the people in the lab that contributed to this study. Paolo Grumati is in the center here, <laughs> as you can see, because it was key for this study. But also many other people that contributed to other part of these projects. And, uh, Many different collaborators, Marco Sandri, the Venetian Institute of Molecular Medicine, Padova for uh, helping us with autophagy, Paolo Bernardi for mitochondria, the physician in, in Bologna, the hospital Rizzoli, uh, bioengineers in Pisa, uh, group in Colonia, and other teams, and of course, the, uh, our granting agencies that allowed us to perform this study, and also the mice, because <laughs> mice were uh, essential for uh, performing this study, and having some idea what happens in patient. Thank you, of course, for your attention.